Church, will you join me in welcoming the whole planet Earth to Big Time Burleson, Texas, y'all. This is the Open Door Experience. Boom! Welcome, my friends. Welcome, everybody all over the planet Earth and folks driving down the road, listening on the radio. We call you guys blessed. Everybody that is here today, we call y'all blessed. Just tell the person next to you, just say, I call you blessed. Yeah, so you have no idea what that person's been called today, so just call them blessed. Amen. And do that. Friends, I'm preaching part two of my sermon series that's called Seven, and today I'm in part two, I'm going to be honing in on the number in his spirit. Um, it's a fascinating study for me and has been a, a part of my walk as long as I've been walking with the Lord to actually look at how things are weighed, how things are measured, and how things are numbered because all those things glorify the Lord. And it's also a unique invitation to see God, well, to see the wonder and the joy of the heart of the Father through really meticulous things. It's like, well, you got to be kidding me, God. Like, you got to be kidding me. I was talking to my friends in South Carolina this last week, and we were, we were there, and we were talking about the numbers. I was actually discussing this with John Burke, who is the writer of a book called Imagine Heaven. And uh, it's a mon I mean, what God has done through that book, so millions of copies, has been so incredible. And it's all about people who have died, who have seen King Jesus, and then been resurrected. We've had a couple of resurrections in this house, haven't we, guys? Yeah, it's like, what? Whoa, I don't know about that. Yeah, man, hang out with us. You'll see. One of the first things that we do whenever we hear anybody has died is we have a resurrection party. Well, let's go over there and pray for them. Who knows? Come on, amen. Like, no, that's too weird for me. Hey, I, it ain't weird for me, man. I believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Amen. I do. And I believe that the same resurrection power that rose Jesus from the dead is living in me right now. And uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to be successful when you go and you pray for God to raise somebody up. Like, but I want to tell you, I, while, I have been dis while I have been disappointed, I've never been shamed. I'm like, thank God for friends who are willing to go after this. Amen. And, and it's just like that. You know, whenever Mama Virginia called me and, and said that, that, that Brother Gene had died, <laughs> Mama Virginia lost her mind. And I don't mean in grief. And she had been his caretaker for, for 21 years. She'd been taking care of him for 21 years, and this is how that conversation went. Ring, ring, hello. Now, Troy, Gene has gone on to glory, and they are wanting to remove his body, and I am on top of him right now. And I said, you are not moving Gene's body until my pastor comes here and prays first. And then I could hear her go, no, no, get away. No, no. No, no, get away. <laughs> I'm like, I better hurry. <laughs> They're going to put that woman in a straight jacket. <laughs> and we went there, and we just had, she's right there on the third row. I want to tell you, Mama Virginia, we're so proud of you, man, and we love you so much. <laughs> Did we see Jane raise up? No, we didn't. And as a matter of fact, a whole lot of us, we ended up filling up that whole hospital room, and we prayed and prayed. I'm telling you guys, the power of God was there. Did we see him raise up? No. No, we did not. But... I'll just put it this way. We haven't yet. How about that? Amen. Why not have extraordinary faith and go after things and just go, man, I'll pray. I mean, what's it going to do? Hurt my pride if everything doesn't work out the way I do? And you don't have faith to protect your pride. Oh, I need to stick with my sermon because I'm about to start going off <laughs> right there. The reason why there's not enough supernatural power in the church is because people cannot check their dignity at the door. All right. Welcome to Hate Mail Monday at Open Door Church. <laughs> so I'm talking about the number seven, and you guys know that I love to talk about numbers. Uh, I love to talk about the unity of God, which God likes to stamp the number one in it. I love unity. Amen. Psalms 133. I love being a faithful witness, and I love what it means to be a faithful witness, and that's when God likes to stamp the number two on something. I love what perfect completion is, the whole enchilada, you know, all three stages. I love all that, and that's the number three. Four has to do with creation, right? North, south, east, and west, four elements, right? right. Four, four lunar cycles, four seasons. I love that. When In the whole creative realm, it's the number four. You get to number five, and that's all about the grace of God, God-given ability to overcome something. Aren't you glad for... For grace, right? Aren't you glad, friends, for God-given ability to actually overcome something? Like, well, 
You know what? I, by, the, by the grace of God, I walked out of Marlboro country. Yeah, you sure did. You sure did. God Almighty gave you the ability to overcome that, and you did. Now you just need to lose 150 pounds, but let's not go off into that. That might not be your story, but that was mine. I'm just going to tell you that. Oh, my gosh, I blew up like a balloon. So I needed a whole different grace, man, to be able to overcome that. And, oh, my gosh, I'm still working on that. Amen. And so you can, you can look at the number six, and six is when God does work in the midst of humanity. It can mean the flesh. It can mean carnal things. But it's just, you know, when God does work in man. And what I found is that God does not hate our humanity. For God so loved the world, the world. God Almighty so loved the world that he gave. And I love that about, I love that about the Father, that he doesn't hate humanity, that he has literally reconciled the world unto the Father at the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's what he did. The, the word reconciled literally means the removal of all hostility. Well, Pastor Troy, are you going to be among witch doctors in Uganda? Yes, I am. What are you going to do? Are you just going to pull out your prayer pistol and deal with them? No, I'm going to bring the Holy Ghost is what I'm going to do. Why? Because God ain't mad at them. He's like, I want to save you. I want to save you. I do. I want to save you. See, if we're going to say that God Almighty can save anybody, we have to believe that anybody is approachable to the Father. And that's reconciliation. And that's, man, whenever you see that kind of a work, you see God stamp on the number six on it. And I really like that a lot. And like, like uh, Romans is the only book in the whole Bible out of the 66 books of the whole Bible that has the word man in it. And it's the sixth book of the New Testament. And there are six different times in the book of Romans that man is the sixth word, including Romans 6.6. 6. Like, what is that all about? It's just God being awesome. Even in famous events, I see it all the time. You know, if you look like, you know, at a big word, that a big world event where man actually achieves something and does something, it's like uh, a guy named Armstrong, a prophetic guy, a, pro a guy with a prophetic name, Armstrong, with a prophetic number on his capsule called 11, Apollo 11, he landed on the moon and he said, that's one, that's one small step for man. The sixth word that he was spoken on the moon was the word man. I'm like, what is all that? It's just God going, ta-da. Well, you get to the number seven, friends, and the number seven is the most prolific book, most prolific number in all the Bible. And since last week we were talking about uh, the book of Revelation, and we're going to continue to talk about the seven different churches. And I was looking at the seven churches as the seven epistles of King Jesus. Man, the letters of King Jesus. Well, there's seven of those. And the number seven is a number that it's a, it's a perfect number. And there are four different kinds of numbers that represents different kinds of perfection. The number three is perfect completion. The number seven is the spirit of God or perfection of spirit or, or all the way manifest, okay, of the spirit of the Lord. The number 10 is perfect order. When God Almighty sets things up into perfect order and things work the way that they're supposed to be. And the number 12 is a number that represents perfect government. Four different works of perfection that God gives through mm, prophetic numbers biblically. So the number seven, the spirit of the living God. And this is a number that marks where God is doing something by his spirit apart from any other source. It's a number that marks his rest and where he rules over things created. Seven is perfection of spirit. So the book of Revelation, as we were already talking about, which which has the seven churches within it, which represents seven stars. As a matter of fact, I got all psychotic and started looking through the book of Revelation, and what I found was 54 sets of sevens. That's how many times the number seven comes. There were seven this, seven that. Like, what are you talking about? Seven spirits, seven churches, seven stars, seven angels, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials, seven beatitudes, seven new things, seven thunders, 7,000 killed here, seven, a seventh angel declaring the mystery of God, uh, the mystery of God finished, saying it is done. Anyway, there's 54 of those. There's 54 sets of sevens in just the book of Revelation. It's like, what is that? You know, my good friend, my good friend Jamie Galloway actually pointed out that there are seven questions asked by God or by angels in the book of Revelation. We actually have a really cool resource on that. And I would encourage you, if you don't know it and if you haven't seen it, to be sure and check that out. I'm not trying to peddle my wares. I'm trying to tell you about a resource. And that's a powerful one. 
It really truly is because it blew my mind. There are seven questions in that. All right. Well, so what is all that? Well, seven represents spiritual perfection. And the book of Revelation is all about Jesus perfecting or completing something. And that's, that's something that you need to understand about kingdom perfection does not mean flawless. The Bible tells you, be you, be you perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, if that means flawless, uh, you're not going to be able to keep that command. Amen? What does it mean? It means perfectly completed in the sense of he's all the way in. There's not anything about God that isn't perfectly in love with you. There's not anything about God that's not perfectly complete. There's not anything about your life that God is not willing to perfectly jump in on. That word, puff, that word perfect there literally means all the way. And a lot of times we, we look at, we look at you know, biblical principles and we get all religious and we start going, well, you know, that thing is not perfect. And that's one of the things that, that Jesus says in the old King James, I have tried you and found that you are not perfect. What that means is you're not all the way in. You're not committed. You're, you're, you're a little bit in, but you're not perfect. You're not all the way. So a good way to understand what the word perfect means in the old King James or the new King James or the older translations is literally all the way. Tell the person next to you, be perfect. Yeah, it literally means get with the program. It means get in the game. Let's go. Let's go. Right? That's what that means. And that's not asking too much. Get in the game the way that the Father is in the game. Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is. Be all the way in. Be, be completely devoted to this. Don't be willing to live another life outside of God. It's good stuff. No plan B. So in the original translations, the phrase Holy Spirit shows up exactly seven times. Now, I know that you think the word Holy Spirit is in the Bible 300,000 times. It's only in the Bible seven times. Uh, what? Uh, so you're thinking about the Holy Ghost. And see, there's a, there's a strange thing in our understanding of the language of the Bible in that we tend to think Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost is the same person. And sometimes it is, but actually it's not. Holy Spirit actually speaks of, if you're looking at the old translations, Holy Spirit actually speaks of the way that God is doing something in the atmosphere that God is doing something. It's a lot like the spirit of prophecy, right? Like, okay, hey, dude, how, how in the world did you come up with that prophetic word? How in the world did you know that? It's not, it may not be that you're a prophet or in the office of a prophet. It may not be that you have the ministry of a prophet. It might just be that you was in the spirit of prophecy. Amen. What is the spirit of prophecy? It's an atmosphere. It's a it's a lot like, okay, there was this aquarium, and I jumped in it, and I became prophetic. That's the spirit of prophecy. Amen. And I want to just tell you, man, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When people start testifying of King Jesus, when people start saying, this is who he is to me, this is who I am to him, I'm not just talking about my history, which is the bad things I did before I was saved. I am talking about my testimony, which is who Jesus is to me and the history I have between him and how awesome he is. And you start talking about that, and suddenly you can start prophesying. You're going to know the heart of the Father in that place. Amen. See what happens? This Bethel group gets around here. I start losing my mind. <laughs> yeah, come on. So in the original translation, the phrase Holy Spirit shows up seven times, and that's it. Only seven times. And again, the number seven has to do with perfection of spirit. Now, the Holy Ghost, which again, that doesn't really work in our language anymore because that sounds secular. It sounds non-Christian. Like, we don't use the word ghost unless, you know, you're, you know, now, it's, it's crazy because, because Bible thumpers who will not say Holy Ghost will still talk about, man, I can't move on that property because of ghosts of them Confederate soldiers. Don't be stupid. <laughs> them are demons, knucklehead. Run them off. Amen. Or some haunted Comanches out there. I mean, uh, the level of galactic stupidity of people in the church blows my mind. Amen. <laughs> So we're talking about Holy Ghost, we're talking about Holy Spirit, we're talking about Holy Ghost, man, we're actually talking about the third part of the Godhead, right? But many times when the Bible's talking about Holy Spirit, it's talking about the different spirit or the way that God moves that's completely different than the rest. It's holy, it's supernatural, but it's literally something that you can jump in on. So I'm going to show you this, okay? 
In Psalms 51, verse 11, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. So see, in this place here, he's talking about the way that God is made manifest, his presence. And many times the Holy Spirit is actually the way that God is showing up, right? Or the spirit of, or the attitude of a church or a person. Like, man, somebody walks into a room and the atmosphere changes. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit, right? But the way that you carry heaven, the way that you carry the presence of the Lord. For me, if I'm going to have a real and authentic conversation with you, I'm going to have to fall into my holy defaults, which have to do with my history with King Jesus. And it's like, if it's about freedom, redemption, and the goodness of God, we can talk all day long. If you're going to ask me to prophesy to you instead of me trying to foretell your future or me trying to figure out something or me trying to, okay, God, well, all I got to do is fall back into a place where I can always find God. Freedom, redemption, and the goodness of God are always there for me. I'll always find Jesus in those places. And if I meet the Father concerning your life in those places, I'm going to have a word for you. My prayer is going to be relevant for you, right? So that's, that's where I find the Holy Spirit. Now, obviously, I have what you and I would call in English the Holy Spirit within me. Yes, I do. And if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit within you, right? But that doesn't mean that he's manifest within your life. Amen. To be made manifest, to, to get in a place where you're constantly seeing, no, man, this is God. God is here in this moment. I recognize the Lord. He's here with me right now. He's doing incredible things. Oh, you know what? That's a God word. That's a God phrase. This is a God prayer. Sometimes you pray out of duty and you press into the Spirit. Amen? It starts off as just a dutiful prayer, you know, like, okay, it's my job to pray for people, so I'm going to pray. But then you can literally press into the Spirit. Like, what is that? That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a person, okay, which is the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about the dwelling place or the manifest presence of Jesus. So one of these places here is in the original translation, the phrase Holy Spirit shows up seven times, and it's Psalms 51 11. That's 5111. Are there any 111 people in here? Yep. You see 111 everywhere he goes? Okay, guys, what is 5 times 111? It's 555. Five, five. Guys, I want to just tell you this, man. If you look up the word Christ, one of the things that you'll find is the gematria of the word Christ or the numerical value in Greek of the word Christ is exactly 555. Five, five. And here's something else, too. If you go to BibleGateway.com and you type up King James and you put the word Christ, it's in the Bible. The word is in the Bible five, five, five times. Cray, cray. I just, you know what? If I just lost you, like, man, will you please just get up and sing Amazing Grace? My God. I'm blowing my mind, man. I don't even think you give me a headache. I find joy in these things. I find joy in the details of these things. I really do. I, I love it. And I just go, man, God, you're so awesome. And he's so thoughtful that he would do that. I'm just so grateful. So he says, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. I was talking to a friend of mine and she mentioned, you know, you might ought to see something in this place right here about the difference between visitation of the Holy Spirit and also habitation of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And I went, nah. All right, next. Here's another one. It is, that is good. That is a really good point. But let me show you this one right here because these next two, they go together. Check this out because this is one of the reasons why people do not live in the holy habitation of God. Even though, even though the Lord lives inside of them, they just don't see God move. They just don't see moves of the Holy Spirit. They don't have dreams and visions. They don't live in a spirit of prayer. And like, why is that? Because their life is not compatible with the Holy Spirit. It has to do with compatibility. Like, it's one thing, man, for God to offer you something. It's a whole other thing for you to conform your life to that and go after it. That's two different mamba jambas right there. And so there's two scriptures that say the word Holy Spirit that have to do with that. One is Isaiah 63, verse 10. But they rebelled and they vexed the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned, therefore he turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. They literally went from being in the move of God that they was fighting for into being into an anti-move of God that they was fighting against the things of the Lord. And like, what is that? Well, they vexed the Holy, they vexed the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means this. They, li they lived lives that was completely in incompatible with what God was trying to do. Like, well, I, wait, wait, stop. You, you're not telling me I'm responsible for anything, are you? 
Yes, I am. Look at this one right here, Ephesians 4.30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. What is this? This whole thing where he says you are sealed unto the day of redemption, it, it literally means this. God is stuck with you, so don't make him miserable. That's my version of that verse. You are sealed into the day of redemption. Like, what is that? You are the holy possession of the Father, and he's all the way into your life. Why do you want to live a life that makes him want to throw up? Be all in. Be ye perfect. Like, what do, you, what do you want to do that for? Like, don't grieve him. Okay, so it has to do with compatibility. And that's a, big, that's a big part of the reason why you see so much visitation of the Holy Spirit, but you don't see habitation of the Holy Spirit. And again, I know that there's theologians, there are theologians in the house, and I know that there are people that are watching like, that brother has no idea what he's talking No, I know the difference. I promise you, I do understand that. And I do know and understand that the Holy Spirit is in you. And the moment that you have faith, the moment that you invite him in, the moment that God Almighty arrests you, Man, that is the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and guys, he will, not leave, he will not leave you, but that does not mean he is made manifest. And if you want to live in the manifest presence of the Lord, or if you want to live life in the Holy Spirit, then you're going to have to, you're going to, have to partner with him in some form of compatibility. And it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that it's even grown up. You can just make baby steps, and, and you can look back and go, man, that was ridiculous. But God blessed it. Why would he do that? Because you were laying down your life, because you were doing what you knew to do, because you were choosing him, because, because you were not being selfish. And God's like, that's my boy. He's a knucklehead, but that's my boy. Mm. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. For God has not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. And I'm put up with my King James because I'm doing the number thing, so I had, to, I had to use this in King James. He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God, who is also given, uh, who is also given unto, unto us his Holy Spirit. But is touching brotherly love? Well, you need not that I write unto you, but you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. That last verse, he goes, I know I'm preaching to the choir. That's what he's saying. Okay? But the first two parts of that, when, when it's one of the seven times that the word Holy Spirit is in the Bible... And remember, seven means perfection of spirit. He says this, look, look, God's not called us to live filthy lives, but he's called us to live holy lives. And if you hate, if you hate people, okay, if you are prejudiced, if you're a racist pig, if you look down upon people because they're poor, or you look down upon people because they're not poor, and you have this thing in you that you really think that God looks like you, acts like you, talks like you, because you kind of suspect you are God, right? And, and you have this thing within your life and that kind of unholiness within your life. He said, man, I want to just tell you, it's not actually God that's, it's not actually people you have a problem with. It's God that you have a problem with. Because you're demanding that God conform to you instead of you conforming to God. <laughs> and at these words, they took up stones. Ah! <laughs> it's an honor to walk in a lifestyle of holiness. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 113 says this, In whom you also trusted after you heard the work of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Guys, I, okay. This one, I was looking at this yesterday, and I was going through this verse, and really, the spirit of promise is holy. That's what this is saying. The way that God Almighty will bring his promises to pass and do it. The, the biblical number for God bringing his promises to pass is the number 14. Yeah, it's all the way through the word. So the Bible says that there are 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the carrying away of Babylon, and 14 generations from the carrying away of Babylon unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, since we're talking about, and that's, and that's Matthew's version, Luke's version says that we're going to start off with Adam and there's going to be a whole bunch of begatting going on. They didn't have TV, so they just begat. And then they get all the way down. They get all the way, get all the way down to Jesus. And Jesus is the 77th generation from Adam. Mmm, manifest spirit. Right on. You guys with me? So, 
it's really holy how God makes his promises come to pass within your life. And he does it by the Holy Spirit. It's a holy thing. Here's another one too. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. But if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Oh, my goodness. Can you see that there's a confusion on us as Christians in the midst of our Christianese? We've, we don't really know what the Holy Spirit is. We think the Holy Spirit is just the third person of the Godhead. The, third per, the Holy Spirit is not just the third person of the Godhead. It is literally the environment that the third person of the Godhead moves into. It's, a, it's something you can enter into. It's not just a person. And it's, we're not talking about a person here. We're talking about how heaven invades earth. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a place. We're talking about how the Spirit of the Lord can overtake something, overcome something, and overwhelm you in the midst of that place. That's what I'm talking about. And that's awesome to me. I love that. I, 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 I love this whole thing, too, about, okay, look, the Father will give you the Holy Spirit. If we're talking about the third person that you and I call the Holy Spirit, which is actually biblically called Holy Ghost— but we don't like the word Holy Ghost because that's too spooky, right? Because, man, what a, what a limp-wristed bunch we Christians are. Least little thing, offend us, freak us out, whatever. So, so we're not actually talking about the third person in Godhead because why? You know what? When the Father is your Father and you are one of His children, you already have the Holy Spirit inside of you. But here's a verse saying, look, if you ask him for the Holy Spirit, he'll give you the Holy Spirit. Well, that's just confusing. The confusing part of it is the English language and our Christianese. That's what's confusing. The Bible is not confused here at all. It's just you and I that get, that get confused over these things. Because of our traditions and because of what we talk out, and it's actually really about what we don't talk out because we're scared to talk about these things. You know, in Texas, man, you can talk about all kinds of stuff. But, man, you start talking about the power of the Holy Ghost, and you start talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, you start talking about resurrection parties, mm, no, no, no. Well, I, don't, I don't feel good when you start talking about that. I feel uncomfortable, and I need a safe place, and I need you to hold my hand because I feel threatened somehow. Oh, please. I want to tell you, there's nobody in Ukraine right now that is, that is scared of a move of God. There is nobody in Ukraine right now that is, is, is scared somebody's going to start believing God for signs and miracles and wonders. They're desperately looking for those people. Amen. Amen. Well, it's a gift from the Lord, and it has to do with, look, if, you know, I have, I have seven grandbabies, and uh, I have, you know, I love my grandbabies. And if, my grand, if one of my grandbabies asks me for something, it's not going to give me delight in this case that if they ask for a piece of bread that I give them a snake or a rock. That, that's not like, okay, do you do that? Like, no, I would not do that. If he's hungry, I'm not going to hit him over the head with a rock. Okay, well, if he, if he asks for something special like a fish or something, are you going to give him a snake? Instead of that, go, ha, ha, isn't that funny? You just got bit, ha, ha. Like, no, never enter into your mind to do that. And then he says this, if you being evil, if that's how good you treat your kids, how much more so is the Father willing to give you the Holy Spirit if you ask him for that? What is that? It is the supernatural presence of God that causes you to overcome everything. It's a way to think. It's a way to pray. It's a way to live. It is, you know, uh, some people knew the Word of God, but Moses knew the ways of God. It is that, it's that, that's the Holy Spirit. He tapped into the Holy Spirit, even though he was the giver of the law. He tapped into the Holy Spirit, the ways of God, a way to move. Like, okay, I've never been able to think about this, but boom, now i got a simple solution to a complicated issue because of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit was given to me in my mind to come up with this amazing solution to a very complicated issue within my life. Right? That's not, that's not the third person of the Godhead. It is a special way um, that God Almighty communicates with you and interfaces with you. So you see, I'm talking about something different. So that's why this word, Holy Spirit, is only in the Bible seven different times. 
We're talking about the way that he communicates and interfaces with you. So, um, I like that verse. I do. I love that verse. I, I just do. I, I, the subject of spiritual gifts is a really big deal. The gift of the Holy Spirit, he says. The gift of the Holy Spirit. It's like, look, I, dude, I want to give you something. Check this out. You, if you ask him, he will give you that. Lord, I need the gift of the Holy Spirit in this. And we can spend the rest of the day talking about spiritual gifts. But if you're like, I don't know what the gifts of the Holy Spirit are. I don't know what the fruit of the Holy Spirit are. Just go to Galatians. Amen. And in Galatians 5, 4, you will find not, you will find nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. You will find nine fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5, 9. Um, and like, well, okay, it's absolutely limited to that. No, it's not. And I, I, I would love to preach on that some other time. But the bottom line is the fruit of the Holy Spirit is a big deal because instead of you thinking you have to be successful in all things, the Holy Spirit will teach you how to be fruitful in all things. And then you won't go around hating yourself and eating worms because you weren't successful in this. You couldn't make that happen. You weren't smart enough for that. You said the wrong thing here. You didn't know. Okay, listen, the deal is bear much fruit. In other words, let the spirit of the living God come out of your life, into your life, and through your life in that situation. And you might even be the bad guy in that situation, and the Holy Spirit still show up because there's fruit. Like, <laughs> what? Like, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely true. I, I, speaking of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, you know those nine that are in Galatians 5, 9? You know, y'all do know that nine represents fruit bearing, right? Okay, Galatians is the ninth book of the New Testament, and it's Galatians 5, 4. 5 plus 4 equals 9. I know, it's crazy. Thank you, sister. You know what? People think I'm nuts. God is the one who's nuts. He's way crazier than any of us. He is so creative and so crazy cool and so willing to be edgy. I'm just, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So it's about time for me to close, and I want to just, I want you to think about this as we talk about the seven, the seven churches. You know, when it comes to a week, we can see that in the creation story that God clearly lays it out from the very beginning that seven is a very important prophetic marker and a very important prophetic measure for God. And then God defines that a week that our time should be measured in a seven-day cycle. Like, why isn't a week 10 days? Why isn't it a week eight days? Why isn't a week three days? Why would it be seven? Because God Almighty defined, I want it to be exactly seven. That's, that's exactly what I want it to be. And there's no reason for, you know, for our years to be divided into seven-day increments, except for God did this. And he's like, look, I want you to have hope for the seventh day, and I want you to rest on the seventh day. And the resurrection of Jesus, you know, happened on the, on the seventh day. And we'll, you're like, well, wait a minute. The seventh day is a Saturday, and man, it, it is, it is. Jesus was actually resurrected on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. And I can show you the scripture for that, but that's the eighth day, okay? And that's where resurrection always happens. Do you know that there's eight people resurrected in the Bible? Did you know that? So eight is new beginnings and it's resurrection power and it's all that kind of cool stuff. But like, okay, so if the Sabbath begins at nighttime on Friday and then we go into our rest cycle on Saturday and then it starts all over again on Sunday, why would God do that? Because God's like, I want you to have hope for that. Guys, we know that a day is to the Lord is a thousand years, right? Do you guys know that scripture? And it's basically from the fall of Adam from the fall of Adam to Abraham is basically 2,000 years. From, it's 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus. It's 2,000 years from Jesus to now, which means we're at the end of the sixth day. Okay? What is the seventh day? The millennial reign, the 1,000 millennial reign, the seventh day of rest is Jesus ruling and reigning in power after he comes back. Jesus is coming back soon. He's coming back soon. And I, I promise you guys, he is. And he's, he wants us to look forward towards the seventh day. That's what it is he wants us to do. I can also tell you that in the heavens, there are also seven visible objects within our, within our solar system that God placed in our firmament, that when you look up, there are seven things that don't move. 
Everything else, everything else doesn't move, but these seven things do move. Do move what? The moon, the sun, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. There's seven of those things that you can see with your visible eye. Why? Because God placed them in your firmament or your field of vision or your field of view. I like that very much. There's seven natural wonders of the world. Mount Everest, Victoria Falls, the Grand Canyon, the Great Barrier Reef, the Northern Lights, and the harbor of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. There are seven ancient seas, the Arctic, the Antarctic, the North and the South Pacific, the North and the South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. Do you know that on my app, because I'm a, I'm a nut about measuring things, one of the things I like to always measure is exactly where am I on the map and what are the numbers that go with that, and is there some way I can partner with God on that just because it'd be funny. But I also have an elevation app that is in my phone, and I look around and go, gee, I wonder what the elevation is here. And he's like, well, why would you do that? Because God designed all that. And I went in on it. So I was at Gordon's Calvary, which is what pretty much everybody believes is the place where Jesus, it was named after a guy that, that discovered it uh, in the late 1800s, and a guy by the name of Gordon. There you go. You guys are paying attention. That's outstanding. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so he... Anyway, but it's the place where Jesus, it fits all the criteria of where Jesus was crucified, and it was called the place of the skull. And it's outside the Damascus gates, and blah, blah, blah. So it's all there, and it's believed that. And I want to just tell you, do you know what the elevation is of Calvary, where the cross of Jesus Christ was? It is 777 feet. I have seen it myself. I just thought, I wonder what the elevation is here or not. Yeah! I freaked out. <laughs> I would just like to tell you this, perfection of spirit does not mean that you're flawless in order to have the spirit of God with you. Perfection of spirit means living a life where the Holy Spirit is in every single part of your life. In every single part of your life, you're partnering with the Holy Spirit. And that's what I see when I look at the number seven. Guys, let's give King Jesus a great big praise. Great. I want to ask you guys to stand up if you would. I'd also like to ask our, our altar team to come down. Hallelujah. Guys, I, I'm going to pray that the Spirit of the Lord would be made manifest in your life. Is there anybody here who wants to have a vision? You want to see signs, miracles, and wonders? Yep. Let's keep this a holy moment for a minute. Come on, let's do this. Let's keep this a holy moment. Are you going after God? Do you want to hear things? Do you want to hear God speak to you? Do you want to, do you want to see things in the Spirit? Do you want to just have such a mind-blowing relationship with the Lord that is way past just you believing someday? That's a Martha kind of relationship with Jesus. Where Jesus tells Martha, Martha, do you know that I'm here to resurrect your brother Lazarus. Oh yeah, someday that's gonna happen. It's like, well, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Like, what are you looking for a day for when I'm here right now? I wanna just tell you that, that there's a way that God can move in your life and there's some things that God wants to do in your life that is so incredible and so legit. But I can also tell you this too, there is a way that you're gonna to have to say yes to him and it starts with salvation. And I appreciate everybody that stayed in here that didn't run out because they were more concerned about their parking situation than they were about how the Spirit of God was about to be poured out. I'm, I'm not shaming anybody, those people that just got up and left out here. That, that shouldn't be your priority. Like, well, I heard a word, it's time to go on about my day. Dude, you have an opportunity here now to actually touch Jesus and Jesus touch you. It's not enough to read about it in a book and to have somebody else read it from a book to you. Man, this has to be your walk with God. And so we have an opportunity here. And uh, I have, we have enough people up here to pray for anybody and everybody in this house. This last week has been the Feast of Purim and it's where God Almighty changes everything around. It is that, it is that prophetic time and that prophetic hour. 
you and I are partnering together to literally take on hell with the water pistol all over the world. We have teams of people on the street of Fort Worth right now. We have teams of people all over the world. We are literally spending every dime that we have off on people that we do not know. We're going after it in such a big way. You cannot tell me that God does not have a move for this house and for this church. I want to I want to see some folks healed today. I want to see some people set free today. I want to see marriages restored today. I want to see people leave poverty and never, ever, ever have to go back to it. I want to see people restored from traumatic events of their youth and be able to go, man, I know now that Jesus was with me and I'm healed and I'm set free now for the rest of my life. I want to see people who have had cancerous reports come back and say, I've been healed by the blood of the lamb and by the word of my testimony.